How's it going, everybody? Welcome to Ambitiously Broke, the most relatable podcast on air to date. My name is Jacob Stiegel. I'm Sam Mobley. And today, we're very lucky to have the one and only Mike Sosha. Other than being one of the best hosts for Super Bowl and Oscar night parties, Mike's right. baseball accomplishments are unmatched. Winning the 1988 World Series as a catcher for the Dodgers and 2002 World Series as a manager for the Angels, his longevity in the sport serves as a testament to his character, as he is also a major figure in youth baseball through his charity and development programs. In addition to being a sports legend, Mike is as savvy as it comes in the world of investing in real estate. Wasting no more time, here's our guest, Mike Sosha. All right, Ooh. Sam, Jacob, great to be here. Guys. Hey, thanks for coming out. Thanks okay. for coming out. Uh, for the background listeners, I've known Mike for, God, I think like 10 years now. It's yeah, been a little you, while. Yeah, and you were the smart brother between you and Lucas because you didn't wear your Dodger hat over the <laughs> no, house go. when you were when I was managing yes. the Angels. So yeah, I, I, I always thought you were a little smarter than uh, Lucas. So hey, it's I, it's, uh, it's showing up. Too. I appreciate it. I try. Yeah, my brother was uh, very smart and decided to wear a Dodgers hat over to Mike's house the first time we ever went over there, and that quickly ended up in the pool, and uh, we got a nice <laughs> That's new a perfect spot. For yeah, him. nice new Angels hat out of it, but it was pretty great. Um, anyway, so today we really just kind of wanted to touch base. Uh, touch base for people that don't know Mike is a fantastic investor he has turned a pro sports career into a lifelong um, journey of investing in real estate um, different funds charities and things like that so we kind of just wanted to touch base talk with him and get some advice about what really would be a good uh, pla- platform path and everything like that for people that are Sam and I's age in our 20s 30s and you know, really any age demographic, but really where people should be putting their money, how they should invest and things like that. Um, so Mike has, you know, plenty of wisdom for us on that, but we're kind of just going to conversationally yeah, some, talk about yeah. it. Uh, some of it's wisdom and some you learn the hard way and sometimes right. you get knocked down, uh, guys. But uh, the model's changed a little bit. I think from when I was coming into, um, came out to, here to California, I was 21 years old when I started playing with the Dodgers. Right. And, uh, it was really impressed on me that, you know, you never know how long your careers are going to be. We weren't making uh, great money back then. But we were making enough to save for sure. But that was the time of, uh, you know, your, uh, your your 12% CDs and your 30% right. certificates of deposit. So it was easy to say, let's just get some money, throw it into these CDs for a year, and you'll get money back, and all of a sudden you'll be safe and let it grow, and then – you know, then you would move on to uh, real estate, which, uh, right. you know, uh, we did. And then, uh, you know, you get married, you have kids, you get more real estate. And then you start to get into your investing with, uh, you know, your mutual funds, your growth funds. And right now, I'm more into some municipal bond funds. I just turned okay. 60. So, you know, the dynamics change. But I think for kids, um, for kids now, the, the model's kind of reversed. I, I, obviously, the certificates of deposit aren't there. They're great to save if you're just going to hold money for a couple months to make right. sure it's, it's secure. But it's growing less than inflation, so you're actually losing money. Uh, gotcha. So what I, what I would look at for the youngsters is, and it's tough to jump into real estate when you're uh, you, when you when you don't have that that kind of money. absolutely you, know, so, you don't have the capital yeah right it's crazy hard so I would say I would look towards the mutual fund uh, okay. variety and I would look towards the Roth IRA any advantage you can get uh, if you just can invest uh, one thousand dollars to start when you're eighteen and you can manage to put at some point when you're twenty when you start to work or you're out of college or whatever you can put away five hundred dollars a month. By the time you're 48 years old, you're sitting on almost three over three quarters of a million dollars. And by the time you're 58 years old, wow. you've got 1.7 million. So the power yes. of investing, power of compounding is still alive. It's just the vehicle's a little bit different than right. when I first started investing back in you know the early 80s. Right. Now, as somebody like myself who I've had various jobs throughout my young career so far, whether it was being a camera operator, real estate, things like that. Um, and we talk about this a lot when we golf, which is buying real estate, um, to be a young person and invest in real estate is usually a very sound investment. And a lot of people always say, you know, really jump into real estate early, get a house, try to do that. And we were just having a conversation about how, you know, house hopping is kind of a thing when you're young. Um, you know, you buy a house, you stay in it for a little while, flip, and you know, you're basically paying yourself. You got to put the money in your pocket, gain the equity and things like that. Um, now, when did you buy your first place? I bought my first uh, condo in 1982 in Claremont, California, and it cost $130,000. Beautiful place. Okay. And I thought I was, I thought I was going to be in debt the rest of my life. But $130,000 <laughs> was 
where I grew oh, up in Philadelphia, man. you had a mansion, and this was a little 1,600-foot condo. But I love it. Uh, real estate is a beautiful thing. Yeah. I think it's, uh, you know, you do, you know, obviously you need to start out with a little bit of capital to start to get right. um, get going, and you, you, need, you, you need your credit score up, and there are some things you have to do as a youngster. Uh, but beautiful real estate is a beautiful thing, and, um, you know, I've, we've been very fortunate over the years that every time we bought something and then had kids, moved to a little bigger house and a little bigger house, um, mm-hmm. You know, we were going in a positive direction. But the the, the beauty of, of, of real estate, I think, is once you get that mortgage, every month you're paying yourself. Uh, right. You know, every month you're, you're, that you're paying that mortgage, uh, you're paying yourself, you're putting equity into your home. You're, uh, you know, you're, uh, it's almost like a forced savings plan. And that's really the bottom line of how you're going to continue to grow financially. Right. Well, essentially, I mean, you're putting money back into your pocket. You know, you're not yes. throwing money into somebody else's pocket or your fireplace when you're renting yeah you know yeah, what I mean? when you're renting yes right. but a 30-year loan you are working for the bank you exactly know? You exactly know, that's the tough part so i would say any youngster that can afford it just when you start out and uh you know um both our kids matt and taylor uh have 15-year loans okay. and they're doing very well with them matt's about almost seven almost eight years through his so he's doing very well with his and taylor's about three years through hers so i think to build that equity Let's minimize the amount of uh, you know minimize the amount of interest you're paying, right? And let that go to to the principal as much as possible, and that's what a 15 year loan does. Yeah, gotcha. So for those of you that don't know, a 15 year versus a 30 year loan on a mortgage, um, when you're initially starting out with a 30 year loan, most of your monthly payment is just going to paying your interest on that loan. Yeah. Whereas if you're running with a 15 year loan. Your month, your initial monthly payments go drastically more towards the equity in your house versus just paying the bank's interest. Exactly. Well said. That's exactly right. And I think that any time that we can pay ourselves, uh, like we said, you know, uh, the, the old adage I learned was pay yourself first. Exactly. And, uh, that's what you do when you're putting $1,000 in, into a mutual fund when you're 18 and adding $500 a month to it if you can. Uh, you're paying yourself, and that's gonna that's gonna compound very quickly. So, uh, in the mortgage end of it, uh, you're paying yourself every time you make that mortgage payment. If you have a 15 year loan, right now, I know a lot of people out here really look at renting because of the house prices, and it's so expensive. And they, you know, they look in our area, which is you know, Thousand Oaks, Westlake, Ventura County, all these little areas. Houses are expensive, and I think you know people see the four hundred thousand dollar price tag and stuff, and they get really nervous about that mortgage and things like that. But what people don't realize is that four hundred thousand dollars, essentially, if you get a fifteen year, is going to be around that twenty seven hundred dollar range. So you're still under three thousand dollars. Now, if you can get that two bedroom or three bedroom, rent a couple out. There's a couple thousand dollars off your mortgage. You're pretty much in the green on yourself. Yep, you which end up reduces at least coming in less than what your rent would cost yeah. at somewhere else right. at a rental house. And right. the environment right now, there's no doubt that you're renting for a reason. Either you're trying to save for a down payment, which is it's kind of counter counterintuitive because you're trying to save for a down payment, but you're burning all this money every 100%. month on rent that's not going anywhere. So how do you save? Right, it's tough. But you have to try to get through it. And I think for some couples that just start out, I mean, when I first came here up up uh, with the Dodgers in 1980, I rented for a couple of years just because you right. never know how long you're going to stay or where exactly. you're going to live and you have to rent. And I think some people in that position right now, they just get out of college and then maybe go rent a place so they understand where they want to work. And that's understandable. But at some point, at some point, and hopefully you're not renting for the, you know, four, five, six year period because you're burning so much money every month. At some point, uh, you have to understand right now where the environment is. Uh, some mortgages are going to be cheaper than rent. And yeah, it's, uh, it's outrageous time. when yep. you start to look at it. And um, I think as a landlord, if you own places and you rent it, you love it. You love renters because so they're, you're making they're cash. Putting, they're putting money in your pocket every month. Yeah, it's it's absolutely incredible to see the renters market right now, especially in our area. I mean, one bedroom apartments are going for over 2000 bucks a month which, you know, at the end of the year, that's $24,000 you just wasted. I mean, essentially you have a roof over your head, but that's profit into yeah. somebody else's pocket. And if We're, you need more yeah. than that one bedroom, you're getting up into the $2,600, $3,000 $3, range. That's right. a house. And, that's and a house though, mortgage. And, you know, you know, as far as, uh, you know, being the realtor in this group. Yeah, that if exactly. You, if you can go uh, buy a, uh, a one bedroom or a two bedroom, um, you know, place, um, your mortgage is going to be comparable or maybe even less than, than what you were just talking about. 100%. Yeah. I mean, one bedroom places out here go for the 
three high threes to low fours for a really nice place. Yeah. Now, you know, your mortgage is going to be very comparable to renting and you own a place that yep. money's going into your pocket in the long run and hell you could even rent it out at the end and you now know we get to the, passive now income we get to the white elephant in the room is what stops people from buying the down yeah. payment right now yep mm-hmm. and the down payment is it's restrictive because um you know i think that's that's a situation i know a lot of young people are in is just trying to say like I'm 25 years old. Okay, I'm going to start saving for a house. Well, you started saving when you were 18. Right. When you started saving when you were 18. Now, that down payment isn't as much of a monster as it is if you if you start too late. So right. this is why the the power of uh, compounding and and having the the um, um, age be on your side as a youngster works. So I would suggest just start saving your money early. Um, you never know when you're going to need it. Right. Some should go into a Roth IRA, comes back at age 59, totally tax-free. Okay. Some into a growth fund. And so somewhere along the line, you might want to take that, that money that's in that growth fund and put it into a house. And right. now you're able to do it quicker, which gets everything going in a positive way. Now you're creating equity instead of burning money in rent. Right, 100%. I mean, it, it's absolutely incredible to me to see how many people... I think, you know, a big thing is a lot of people are scared to start that conversation, especially as, you know, young 18 to 25 year olds, because the finances are so shaky and because jobs are so hit or miss, you know, not a lot of us are making that eighty, ninety thousand dollars range right now. Um, fresh out of college, a lot of us are hitting that 30, 40, if you're lucky kind of mm-hmm. area. So they think that it's so far out of grasp. Well, let me ask you this, Jacob, how much money do you piss away every month? Um, way too much. Way too much. We I have, guarantee you that that there's there's a hundred dollars a oh month man. flying out of your pocket easily. That doesn't have to be and shouldn't easily. be. That should be going to pay yourself. So 100%. no matter what what your situation is, you always you always have a little bit of money you can put away every month. Right. And I think the best way to do it now it's much easier now than when I was young. Uh, you know, you get online, you do your online banking, you just have a flip into another account every month, let it flip into another account. Right. And from that account, it can go into a growth fund and or wherever you were designated to go. But pay yourself first. It might only be $100 a month, but whatever it is, start early. Right. Now, I know I was talking to you guys both earlier a little bit um, about a book that I was reading called Profit First. Now, for some of the listeners that don't know, I'm not a big reader. So I read at a very slow pace. Um, this is probably the first book I've ever read. Um, Somehow I believe that, Jacob. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good place to start. Yeah, now. it's a great place to start. Um, but this book's absolutely phenomenal. It is a little bit excessive for somebody that's my age and getting into investing because it's saying, you know, you need these five, six bank accounts. And I really just don't have the capital to even fund five bank accounts. You do not need five bank yeah. accounts. I would disagree with that. I'm sure I, exactly. I read the book. I'm going to read it. But I, I think it's a simple way of just organizing yourself. And exactly. You're going to need one bank account for your daily bills, your checking, mm-hmm. where you're, wherever you're where your paycheck goes into uh, and you want out of that you want to flip it into your savings account which will automatically flip every month and from there it can be designated to go to a brokerage Uh, sometimes if you work with some banks they have a brokerage right in house and they can just flip it into a growth fund for you or you have your broker um, have it sent to your broker every month and he's going to put it into a uh, you know put it into a growth fund for you so right. the six accounts I think it gets too complicated yeah. and I that. agree it's and it's a bit messy nowadays there's so many ways to manage your money through apps such as like the, the Intuit Mint and Clarity Money there's so many ways to track that and be on top of it and know what you're spending and know what you're saving every month that it's easier to do it that way than it is to have the six bank accounts that they're recommending. Oh, totally. Yeah, but I mean, the the thing besides the six bank accounts, like, yes, I agree that that part is a little bit overboard um, and it's a lot to digest, but their whole mentality is a lot like Mike, you've been saying, you got to pay yourself first. Yep. Your, your bills are going to come out no matter what. You're going to pay your bills, but you have to have the profit first. You got to budget to have the money into your account as profit before you pay your bills. You know, if you have, you, you obviously have to allocate the money for your bills and make sure that you can pay them, but you have to, even if it's $50, $100, $1,000, whatever you can afford, you got to pay yourself first. That way you're, you're in the green constantly. Mm-hmm. If you're in the green, it's almost impossible to get into the red if you set that as a, you know, as, as a habit, as a way of going forward from a young age. Jake, you're talking about organization. And, yes. And, and it's really, I think, for all of us, uh, it took me a while when I was young to be organized. Right. From the time I can remember, my, my room was always the messiest out of anybody's <laughs> room. You know, it was just, 
Uh, you know, I had pockets out, leave change in my pants when I went to the wash. My mom, I can't tell you how many times she told me that. But <laughs> as you grow and you get older, uh, you start to understand the, the organization. And the beautiful thing about paying yourself first is if you have a good job, you know every two weeks you're getting paid. Right. Um, so you know how much you want to pay yourself every month or every two weeks, whatever it is. Take a part, portion of that designated to go right into that second fund. And now if your bank account goes down to $1 after two weeks, who cares? Right. You're already, you've already taken care of your future. You're already, you're already investing in yourself. You paid yourself yep. first. Now you can go you can pay the electric bill, pay your mortgage, pay uh, the things you need. But it helps, exactly. you know, it helps you to know what disposable income you have after you've paid yourself first. And once that exactly. happens, you're, you're organized and you understand it. And you know that I can, go, I can go out. Yeah, we can go to the movies three times this week. Or I can do anything I want this week right. because I know what I can spend, what I can afford. So it's just a form of budgeting. And hopefully you have good enough work where you're putting more away and still can uh, have the disposable cash that you want that is, you know, that's that's there for you. But I think until you get there, let's be a little, let's be a little greedy and let's be a little, right. uh, yeah. let's be a little greedy for our future and, and, and fund that first. And I think an issue nowadays is a lot of people look at their, they get their first paycheck and they see that only a quarter of it is going to go to their bills and they let, they look at it and see it all this disposable income they have but they don't think about saving them putting the money away and putting it in growth accounts and retirement because that's not something that's on their mind the next 40 years isn't on a lot of people's minds um so i mean i think that's something that people definitely need to start doing is switching that mindset to organizing and setting aside before you go and look at your disposable income exactly well, yeah. we, we're talking about like not even everyone's saying well that's age 60 or 65 when no, if you work the model we talked about earlier from when you're 18 and you can start to, yeah. to put money away, we're talking about before you're 50. 48. You're, you're sitting on about three quarters of a million yeah. dollars. And like you said, if you have kids, that's just when they're getting into college. That's yes. just when you're having these new payments. Your kids want to get, you're getting close to retirement. I mean, you reach a point that you retire early even. I mean, I think a big thing, and I listen to a lot of speeches by a gentleman named uh, Grant Cardone. Um, who's a real estate investor. He has a fantastic, fantastic business out of Florida, but he always says, you know, the goal isn't to be wealthy, I guess, is the, the term that people would use, but really what you're shooting for is financially free. Mm -hmm. You're shooting to pay off the house, to be able to go on the vacations when you want, to be able to go out to the dinners when you want and not have to worry about it. So they say nowadays that to be able to do that, you have to be a double digit millionaire. Now, with the model that we were talking about earlier, that at least sets you on a fantastic path of three quarters of a million dollars sitting there by the time you're almost 50 that exactly. you Jacob, forgot about, essentially. Jacob, and that will, you will, that will increase. The model is very minimal. We right. start talking out $100 a month. When exactly. And going to $500 a month when you're you know, 22, um, you are going to be... You're going to be you're going to fly past that number because 100%. you're going to be making enough money that you can increase that to a thousand. You do like absolutely. a thousand. You do like a thousand dollars a month all of a sudden, which is you're you're absolutely like into a growth fund, and then you, you're funding maybe five. With the the the, uh, the caps are still going up, the ceilings will still go up. Right. You know, for your Roth IRA, you you might be putting in six hundred to eight hundred dollars a month in in five years from now. That is going to that's going to be crazy money by the time you're 60. hundred percent. I think that's where we need to get to. Um, we, we always also related to this, you know, inflation is like anywhere. It can be two to 4%, usually around 4% is, right. is usually what it's been historically. Um, so you've got to stay ahead of that. Right. I remember when a gallon of gasoline was 37 cents. I remember my first car I bought a, you know, 1976, uh, uh, Dodge, uh, Daytona was $5,100. I love it. Um, love that's it. not, that's not going to happen now. So we've got to all understand, like, you know, where we want to be 20 years from now. We want to be 40 years from now. Right. Uh, the cost of living is going to continue to increase. Yep. And we need to find a way to stay ahead of it. And the best way to stay ahead of it right now uh, for young kids is to, is to get into some growth funds. Uh, the second best is definitely going to be the real estate aspect where you right. start to move up on your house or you buy some investment properties that sometimes after you start to get your, you start to get settled. And um, like the the one that's kind of phased out right now are the CDs, and you know because you right. just it's just not even stand up with inflation right now. It's a great sound investment. It's like buying treasuries. Uh, it's extremely but, safe, but yeah, it's not. But it's the not reward gonna, is not high. It's not going to get you where you want to be financially. Yep. In low sense. risk, low reward. Right. You guys need growth. Yeah, hundred percent. Now, um, totally off topic, 
but we have a very solid golf game that we hit every week around. And I know that's where a lot of fantastic conversations go down about investing and finances and things like that. Um, but I think also a big thing is to understand, like we've kind of been talking about and everything is the budget that goes into it. You know, when we say we enjoy these golf games and things like that, that's on my end. It, it goes to a lot of, yes, like I golf with my dad, I golf with my friends and things like that, where fortunately my parents will help me out with that. But like you had mentioned earlier, if, if that comes down to you can only go once a week or you can only go once a month or things like that. I think people that are our age and demographic are a little worried to back off the lifestyle a little bit yeah. in order to succeed farther down the road because of social media and this image you have to portray of success. People are a little afraid to say, you know, listen, I'm saving for a future in the long run instead of I'm going to go out and buy this fantastic car that looks great and i love cars like and that's a big thing yeah. nowadays is i feel like people they get their first job out of college and they're making fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year and it's significantly more than they've ever made in a lot of cases so they go out and they buy their first car they buy their they how buy the clothes out. how about clothes, yeah exactly. tennis, anything sneakers, tennis shoes everything yeah and, anything. and i think you you know you hit the nail on the head i mean uh like golf is is something i think if you're going to play it a lot and you're going to pay for it uh you need to earn the right to do that. 100%. And the only way you earn a right to do that is, is to be financially sound Yep. Um, and understand the putting money away, the growth aspect of it, uh, pay yourself first, and maybe in that disposable income pile, there's enough to go play enough golf to twice, go do a, something. Week, twice yeah. a month, you know, or whatever. Exactly, because otherwise it's the facade, which a lot of people are living the facade that are our age. Like you see these kids, at least when I'll go out, I'll see these kids with these big diamond earrings or, you know, a fancy chain that they wear. Maybe I roll with a different group, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you'll see these kids that kind of flaunt what they have yeah. and they wear the expensive clothes or their sneakers that are supposedly $5,000 and all this stuff. And it's like, well, great. That's $5,000 you just spent on shoes. Right. Like wait till you step. Shoes that's not going to last yeah. that long. Wait till you step in a piece of gum or some right. shit or like whatever. Then that $5,000 is now tainted. Number one, it's not worth what it was. Like that could have been five thousand into an investment or a fund into or your into your pocket. Or your, uh, the, that the, the people the, is the, crazy. And, and it's beautiful to be able to afford a five thousand dollar pair of shoes, and the people that are yeah. affording those have already uh, paid themselves and they're financially right. sound. Well, hopefully, and yeah, we hope so. <laughs> they're financially sound, and they can do that. And yeah, you're right. There's always exactly. outliers of people that shouldn't be doing it or buying five thousand dollar pairs of shoes and yeah. they get their house on foreclosure but when they go up to the court steps they look good because they, they look they, fantastic five thousand dollar pair of shoes up to the right. courthouse steps you it's know? amazing to me and you know a lot of people that i've talked to believe that you have to kind of live the lifestyle to reach that lifestyle yeah. but i the feel fake like it till you make it method. yeah the fake it till you make it but in a lot of cases i mean you spend too much money you reach Trying this point where it. you have too much debt you have credit cards you have loans no, and it's, don't don't start on credit cards yeah i think they're that horrible. any 18 year old has a credit card um if i'm a responsible adult um i'm chopping it up and telling them no this is one thing you do not need yep the instant gratification mm -hmm. i think that is alive and well um is too much and it's just too easy to buy stuff it's you you're sitting right here we can sit down and order probably 10 grand worth of stuff in 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 10 well, minutes right if you that, wanted to that 10 grand Absolutely, would, would yeah. tank me for a few years but, <laughs> yeah but but, so, but you could issue. theoretically that is, that yes so yes yeah i don't think there's any reason why a youngster needs a credit card i know it does build your credit score and there are some other peripheral things you can look at right uh but uh, live within your means and if you could afford 100%. something your bank account will tell you that you can afford it yeah, on right. a credit card. And I think that's a big thing for us that at least on our show we're trying to push is like don't be afraid to have the conversation about the struggle and the financial aspect of it. Like like you just said, live within your means. You right. know, if, if you're going above and beyond to really put on the facade in the face of somebody who's successful, make sure that you've already put the profit in your pocket and got your finances set. And that is success. You know what I mean? The organization and the money in your pocket is success, but the facade of it is not. You know, are you going for basic cable at $99 when you're renting, or are you going to try to get the whole package for $350 a month? You know, that's exactly that's the choices I think that, that kids need to yeah. make, especially if they are just out and they're renting, is the fact of like understanding, uh, you know, uh, the more I can save, the more I can cut my costs, the more things I can do when I'm young, uh, I'm going to eventually earn 
I'm going to eventually earn the uh, the uh, the ability to go out and buy that nice car. Or yeah, go out, go out and, and eat maybe twice a week. Or there's two. so many aspects to that too. I mean, even nowadays with the iPhones, you get your iPhone for monthly payments, but it's the difference between choosing the iPhone that's thirty dollars a month and choosing the iPhone that's sixty dollars a month. I mean, just that thirty dollars alone going into your savings account that's thirty dollars. You do that like three or four more times, and you got your hundred dollars a month right yep. there that you're putting away, and you're on exactly. your, you're on your road. You're right. on, the, on the road. Exactly. Now, Mike, I do have a question. Okay. Coming out here as a uh, young athlete, a lot of athletes get that you know signing bonus, and it may have been different when you started or anything like that. But I hear on TV all these time all the time these kids getting these crazy huge you know seven year contracts for hundreds of millions of dollars in baseball, football, soccer, things like that. Um, and they, I'm sure, get some pretty hefty signing bonuses. Um, and I'm sure have no idea what to do with them. Uh, but I, I'm guessing they have great teams on their back because none of them really seem to go too nuts. But how did you take coming out here as a pro athlete, growing up in the, you know, in the eye of sports and things like that, into a lifelong longevity of finances instead of going crazy and you know making these ridiculous purchases uh, that you, you know, see it, some people it, make it gets back to your upbringing you know my mom and dad lived paycheck to paycheck and gotcha worked very very hard to to get us things we need uh, one thing is like chuck taylor converse were the were like the talk of the town back then they right. had a chuck taylor converse high tops that still was are it. they're the best and they were like 11 dollars back then wow so I always had to get the Beta Bullets because they were $6. And it was the same exact shoe, only didn't have the Chuck uh -huh. Taylor logo on it. And right. it said Beta Bullets. looked just like Chuck Taylor, but it didn't. So I was, you know, kind of groomed with the fact of like, and I was like a little upset about them. They're, These aren't Chuck Taylors. What are you trying to do? He said, no, right. they're the same exact shoe. Wear them. And, you know, I'd say, oh, they don't fit. You know, I try to do yeah. something. <laughs> I got, I'm going to have to get the new ones. Yeah, but I as far know. as like getting big bonuses, the bonuses in 1976 when I signed are nowhere near what, they're, what they are now. Right. But still, um, you, it's, a, it's a lot of money for somebody that really, I, you know, I was making um, three and a half dollars an hour in right. my summer job for two Prior, months yeah. after school. And yeah. That was, you know, that's what I was making. So it is a lot of money. And that's where like the CDs came into effect. Like saying, right. you because know, my mom and dad knew. It was a lot of money in their minds too. I mean, it was what my mom made, and probably, you know, it took her six years to make what I signed for. You know, of work. Right. So, what what um, what uh, what happened there? I think was the influences of your family, understanding. Uh, you know, just saving. Um, my parents were not stock market people. They were just put it in the bank, and like I said, it was much easier then with CDs at you know twelve right. percent. If CDs are twelve percent now, this would be a lot easier. It'd be way easier. Ways, the world you know. would be a lot different. Yeah, it would be so. That's where it started with me, and okay. um, and it started out early where I think it was a, a blessing to get out, in get out here in California because the um, you know, the cost of living is a wake-up call that right. says, wow, you know, if I want to live out here, um, there has to be some kind of a some kind of a uh, financial um, structure and organization is going to let me continue to to even have a modest lifestyle out here if I want to stay out here, and, and it helped a lot. Right now, when you were managing, did you have a lot of conversations with players about finances and things like oh, that? Yeah, I, I, did, I, did. I know you talk to me about it quite often, yeah. so I can only imagine, you know, locker room practice conversations that, you know, because again, these kids are literally our age right. yeah. coming out here as athletes making crazy right. amounts of money. We had, uh, you know, and, and the guys, the guys are making a lot of money and we've really had most guys that understood this, right. uh, the fact of it. Um, one incident where a player came in, had his truck all tricked out and was bragging how it cost him 160 grand and he was only in the big leagues for, <laughs> he was only in the big leagues for, for like three years and he already had two kids and I just Jeez. took him aside and said, look at, um, you just spent 160 grand on this truck. Uh, did you think about your kid's college funds that you might want to put it in? Or do you think how much money you could have saved doing it? And he kind of looked at me and said, oh, no, I get it, Mike. Okay. So, right. like, you know, I think you have those conversations just because, in, you know, baseball is different than – and professional sports is different than pretty much any other any other um, oh, for sure. occupation where you get uh, a ton of money. It's almost like the sprint, you know, the 50-yard sprint, and you run real hard for 50 yards, and then the race is over, and you get, you know – you get accolades and you can't even go the extra 50 yards because you're you're done but you, right. you know you finish your 50 as opposed to running a marathon where you know you know you're going to make money for a long time 
So I know guys who are very, very extremely talented athletes, great baseball players, and never got to that payday that some of us were fortunate enough to get to because right. their careers were cut short. So that's why baseball is different. So when you get the money, uh, you want to make sure that uh, you know that you're investing it, uh, making sure that it's going into you know into good areas. And I think it's the same thing. Like you know, you're 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 in real estate. There's going to be some big commissions you have, and what are you going to do with those commissions? Are you right. gonna, are you going to flaunt it and say oh, I'll get another one down the road when you when you might not get one for it's, eight months? Uh, yeah, a year. So, Who right? knows? You don't know. So. I think that it, it, it just, you have to have that discipline. You have to have that uh, structure in place that lets you, when you do get money, like we did in baseball, and it's a lot of money sometimes at a very early age that you're being responsible with it and you have the discipline to be responsible with it. And if you can right. do that, then uh, then really you can sleep at night. Right, 100%. And I think there's a, a lot to say about, you know, either coming from the saving aspect of it, like starting with, you know, the zero dollars and building up to that wealth or starting out very wealthy and still building that. But mm -hmm. it all kind of has the same aspect is what it seems to me, you know, being a young kid, I see these people that are, that start at a very high level, these kids whose parents are very well off and they, you know, might be on a trust fund that's absolutely through the roof, but they also have to be financially smart because if they go blow that money like an idiot, yeah. then they're it's back in the same boat that everyone else is. It's for them to blow that money, and exactly. that's what a lot of people don't realize. But we've seen a lot of people that have gone from nothing to and built just amazing through savings empires. and investment and have created, yeah, an amazing amount of wealth. Yeah, I mean... Uh, I, you're right. You guys are hitting really hitting a chord here. I think the, the issue with uh, trust funds and a lot of us you know, have been very, very blessed throughout our lives. You have yeah. some money, but you've got to be very, very careful, careful that... You don't try to make your kid. They got to make themselves. Exactly. And they've got to go out there and they've got to earn it. They've got to get their lumps. They got to understand a budget. They got to understand what to do. And that's something that Ann and I have been very, very cognizant of with our kids to say, look at, you know, we'll help you out a little bit here or there, whatever you need. We paid for their college, so they don't have right. any, any any college debt, which is huge right now. Yep. Uh, but look at you guys. You guys got to, you know, we got to take those water wings off. You got to learn how to swim. And, 100%. And, and you got to learn how to. If you're going to stub your toe, you're going to stub your toe. And I think these, these kids appreciate it and they understand the value of, of uh, money, the value of saving, and they know they've got to work hard to get to a certain um, level uh, to where they can, uh, you know, they can enjoy some things. And they've, they've like worked to get the privilege to go out there and do some of the things that they weren't able to do three years ago because they couldn't afford it. Right. Yep. And I think, you know, I, of course, know your kids very well and hang out with them and have grown up around them as well. And they are very much like myself and my brother and Sam and everybody around us. Like they work, they do things that, you know, make them progress as people. And like you said, they're learning and they're, they're taking the lumps just like everyone else. I see a lot of kids nowadays, especially in like tabloids and stuff like that, who, you know, are very much fed with a golden spoon and they usually end up either broke or into some crazy stuff. I mean, yes, there are the ones that are the anomalies that yeah. end up successful, but. And I mean, some of the best lessons are when you fail on your own. Yeah. It's like, you're only gonna learn, a lot of the times you're gonna learn the most if something is your own fault and something is, like even for me personally, right. just looking at credit cards, it's like I had one credit card with like $1,000 and it reached a point where I had spent the whole $1,000. Believe. And yes. I remember that. Yeah, that was a good trip. Because I maxed mine out too. Right. Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, that's that's going to be another show. <laughs> that's, another that's another show. show. That's another show. But, you know, it's a learn. it was a learning experience for me and it's something that I have never done again right. and haven't reached that point again because I learned the hard way and had to work my way through to pay that credit card off and like work that down. I mean, it's, it's absolutely incredible. I know for myself right now, I have a pretty hefty credit card bill, but that's due to a vacation that we went on. I knew I was going to get myself into the credit card bill. Well, I'm cutting that credit card up right now. Uh, hey, me too. Trust me. Yeah, that, that happened a long where time ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, it's one of those where you have to jump in the deep end and you have to say, you know, okay, I'm going to make this decision and pull this credit card for the points or the miles that yeah. I'm going to get on this trip to be able to parlay it or whatever which is a dumb decision since we talked about that earlier, but I did it. I made that decision. And now like I have the payment, I have to do it. I have to pay it off, but I'm learning from it. I learned that that's a stupid decision to get the credit card in the first place, yep. but it was sink or swim. I made the choice. I have to learn from it. I have to progress with my finances to be able to 
um, allocate the money to pay that off every month and not just pay the principal or, you know, anything like that. I have to actually substantially decrease that amount that I owe. And I think, you know, a lot of people are scared to make that jump. And a lot of young people are scared to take the leap and say, you know, financially, this might be a little bit of a risk and I'm going to invest in this fund that's going to grow over time. And it might not pay off in the first year in my eyes. And you they know might, I mean? you might be living paycheck to paycheck. Exactly. You might be like having issues with money, but saving initially is what will help you grow it, more. Yeah, exactly. Eventually. Right. But I don't, I don't think you're going paycheck to paycheck in that regard, because if you're investing in a growth fund, you can get that money in two days. It's very right. true. So yeah, you're very saving. True. So you want, you don't want to, but if you had to, for any reason that you, you, could, you, always you could always pull it out. So, so you'll, you'll be fine. Um, you know, I, I think that your first uh, your first commission check is going to pay off that credit card for sure. Jacob. My first commission check is going to be paying off a lot of things. Good. I got a car to pay off. I got a credit card to pay and off. Now we're going to have a little bonfire with all the credit cards. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> oh yeah, that that's happened in my mind many of times. I want to burn those things so bad. Um, yeah. But you guys shouldn't lose the opportunity of your youth to to um, invest early and just exactly yeah. let it go. I mean, we're all going to live to 150. You know, right. be, then you could start it. I know a lot of my friends right. didn't pay a lot of attention to all of a sudden they hit 50 years old and they go, wow, I got to start. I got to start. I want to retire at 62. I want to retire at 65. And they're like, well, they, you, you just lost 30 years of investing. It's crazy to get here. Yeah. And crazy. now you're going to try to make it up in 12, 15 years. I said, it's not going to work that way. And right. Because your money really compounds like the last five years of any investment, you know, where, right. before you're going to take it out. That's when you're making 10% really on yes, three on, quarters of a exactly. million, it's, yes. that's where a lot of your money comes from. And I mean, time is one of the most vital things we have. And it's a lot, it's one thing that a lot of people can't get back. I mean, my dad, my situation now is like, I have my Roth IRA set up. I have my investment account, Good. my growth account and savings. And it's, my dad has helped me reach that point because his parents weren't there to help him get to there yeah and it's that's something that he's always driven into me so much is that time is vital and starting early will help you get set in the end yeah, it exactly. sounds like your mechanisms in place mm-hmm. and now we just got to find a way to fund your your growth fund fund your Roth IRA and um, and then obviously have your budget for what your your daily or your cost of living is for for every month and and you're on your way and that's um you know, that's what I think every youngster's got to try to get to. So you're ahead of the game. 100%. Unless you're 40 years old. How old are you, Sam? Uh, 22. Yeah, you're good. You're in 22. Shape. Sam's yeah. a child. I'm yes. only 24. I said that he's really <laughs> I'll young. I'll be 23 in yeah. um, weeks, so. so since we're getting close to the end of our episode, Sam and I do have a segment. We call it the expense report. Uh, we like to go over our you know, weekly slash monthly expenses, whatever we have. Bag going. On it or what? You can bag on it all you want. <laughs> Good. Um, I'm more than happy to go first. This is the cost report um, or expense report. Uh, last week, I know the previous show, episode two, I said I spent probably about a thousand bucks that week or a hundred. Mm-hmm. I think it was like $400. Something like that, yeah. Uh, but that was because I was working on a project. I had a lot of fuel to pay for in driving. I am waiting for that, that paycheck, hopefully. Um, but that being said this week i have reduced it is friday today i have reduced my funds this week to fifty dollars so oh, i've wow. only spent 50 this week uh, i was very conscious of what i was doing i made sure i was not eating where out you, as much where, as i did where did you go eat twinkies all week? i <laughs> ate twinkies all week i'm up 15 pounds no i'm just kidding um i actually cooked a lot at home i uh i, I meal prepped a lot Good. more than i did the week prior um, I really watched my unnecessary driving and, you know, really, really just tried to see where I could cut my expenses. And that's what I got to. So I was at 50 this week. Granted, I do have a convention I'm going to tomorrow. So hopefully there's free food. Um, <laughs> but that, that is my weekly expense this that's week. Not bad. I, I, I want to know where you got to $400 was mostly, mostly gas. Mostly, yes. I was commuting to Huntington Beach every day for much, six days. Uh, how much you get paid for that uh, job? That job will hopefully, uh, granted if the uh, Royal British Air Force pays me, <laughs> I have not heard back from them since yeah, I sent they're, my invoice. They're, they're tied up with Brexit, so I don't yeah. know what they're going to have. Yeah, um, that job was a $200 a day flat rate, so good. that should be a good, you know, so thousand, coming out ahead thousand sure. bucks. Yeah, yeah so, so I'll cut co- your 400 to make 400 to make 600. 600 so and we're going to put that 600, 500 straight into the savings. No, 
You're paying well, that I, credit yes. card Yes. <laughs> okay, I got to pay the credit card off. Yes. I, I want to put it in the savings. No, nope. um, nope. no, it's going to the credit right card. To <laughs> there pay we off, go. Pay off that credit card. There we go. There right. we go. Uh, I think mine was around $100 this week. There we go. Yeah, not too bad. I did eat out a little much, and I did buy three Amazon Echoes on Amazon because they were 75% off. And, you know, I'm addicted but, to deals. But wow. hang on, hang on. You... If you're smart, because I know the business that you want to start, you can write yep. that off as a business expense. Also, I believe I'm going to give them away on my social media for my smart home company. So there if we go. Interested, Good. We're have People some listening, I know we're on nice. Facebook Live right now as well as we're recording this for YouTube. If you're listening, Sam, I don't know if your website's up yet or anything like that, but stay tuned. Sam says yep. he might be giving those away. So we'll check be releasing it out. That. Maybe one will give away on Ambitiously Broke. There we go. Maybe we'll give one away. Nice. Good job. That's very nice. So. So you spent a thousand dollars, you said? Hundred fifty. Hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. Was love the week before was a thousand or no? Uh no. Uh the week Where before was two hundred. Oh, week before was two hundred. I, I thought I spent a thousand, but I was only like four hundred actually. Okay. I think. Um All right, that's good then. That's good. I Make think sure we're getting you, there. were you able to save some money? I was not. Okay. I know. Then, then that was the downside bought, of the so week. So you bought three Echoes before yep. you put money away for yourself. Right. See, and that was the issue. I went, I looked at the disposable income before I saved instead of after. Yes. There yes. we go. There's a, that's a, that's definitely a mistake. Know what you can, know what you can, uh, what you can afford to spend after you've paid yourself. There we go. It'll help you to do that. So for everybody listening, uh, that is basically our time for today. We really love doing this for you guys. We like growing with you guys. We really enjoy talking about investing. We have, again, Mike Sosha, phenomenal investor, phenomenal manager, phenomenal baseball player, and all around amazing person and friend. Um, but we really just want to yeah, let you, you, oh. you missed a couple of things there, oh, there that there I we go. You, remember you gave you that. List I know to say, I, I had my that. list okay, somewhere. You, yeah, so you missed a couple of things, but go ahead. There we go. Um, phenomenal golfer. There we go. Got to throw that in there. Yep. Um, but we really just want to grow with you guys. We want to get these messages out there that you really got to get your systems in place. Young start, um, start investing in yourself before you're, you know, investing in these crazy things and really get all your checks and balances situated so that you're comfortable having these conversations and really don't be afraid to talk to people. We're out here talking about it. We're airing out our dirty laundry about our finances and you know, it, it's helping us in the long run. And I think it's really amazing for all of us to see and grow together as a team that is ambitiously broke. Absolutely. And you know, I just want to thank you, Mike, for coming out here and yeah. we're looking forward to the next episode. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, what you guys are doing is important. Um, and all your listeners, uh, I think it's a great lesson to understand. Ambitiously, ambitiously broke is, um, is a moniker you want to change to let's get rich. Exactly. And, and yep. uh, I think, I think that youngsters, if they start at a young age, that can happen. Uh, but they just have to understand the the mechanism to do it. So hopefully you guys are going to continue to bring that to, to your, your uh, listeners. Exactly. And just like we did here with Mike, each week we're going to be talking about finances, investing, things that us young people can do to really uh, increase our lives and grow together. Ambitiously yep. Broke is going to become Ambitiously Rich. So thank you guys for listening. We'll see you next week.